God into their lives. If in your home they're hearing things that they should, shouldn't be hearing, then perhaps you need to reprioritize your life and uh, start speaking the blessings of God over your house and over your family and uh, over their lives. There's not a morning that I don't get up that I don't, I don't pray the blessings of God over my family. Every single morning, the first thing I do is I thank God. Lord, I thank you that you kept my family safe through another 24 hours. I thank you for keeping us safe through another day and another night. And now I pray your blessings upon my family today. And I pray over my wife and my children. And I just ask for God's favor upon them. Amen. And if you're not doing that, that's something that you should uh, implement into your life. Pray the blessings of God over their lives. I'm going to tell you, there's enough curse going on in the world today. We don't have to ask for evil things. There's evil things always around us. But the Bible said where evil is, does, doth God's grace much more abound. Amen. And so I'm just excited about uh, baptizing Victoria this morning, and we will do that here in a few minutes. Please, everybody, stay over uh, this morning to partake in, in, our, in our dinner this, this, this afternoon or, or right at lunchtime. And uh, I can assure you that it's going to be good. Thankful for uh, Eugenia and Tabitha that have uh, taken the time. And, and uh, they're over there doing the cooking now and a few of our youth. And so thankful for them for uh, taking the time to do that. Amen. How many of you know that we need revival? Amen. Well, I got about one hand clap and one hallelujah. So, amen. How many of you know that we need revival? Amen. We need revival in our world today. Amen. As much as things as we see going on in the world and, and things happening, when we see people that used to love him but we just don't see that love exhibited for him like we used to, we need revival. And when we see earthly interests and occupations are more important to us than eternal uh, ones, we need revival. When we see the church waxing cold and more colder and colder all the time, we need a revival. When we would rather sit and watch TV and read secular books and magazines more than we would rather read the Bible and the Word of God and pray, we need a revival. When we have more desire for the things of the world than we do for the things of God, we need revival. When we have more desire than we see for the things of God, we need a revival in our church. When our Christianity is joyless and passionless, we need a revival. When we know the truth in our heads, but we're not practicing them in our lives, we need to be revived. Come on, is somebody hearing me this morning? When we uh, do not tremble at the Word of God, you know, there used to be a day and time where when we would hear the Word of God, we would tremble at the Word of God. Now we hear people saying all the time, I don't really care what the Bible says. I don't really care what it says because... We no longer live with a biblical worldview in our society today. You know, it used to be in what I called the, the World War II uh, day and time. Even if people did not serve God and live for God, they still knew the difference in what was right and what was wrong. There was a biblical worldview that was present in the world. But we no longer have a biblical worldview. The statistics have proven that uh, uh, above 50% or it's, it's like 75% of our society today does not, uh, b does not have a biblical worldview. Now I'm not saying that they don't totally believe in the Bible, but I'm saying that their worldview is not built upon biblical princi principles. When we seldom think thoughts of eternity, we need revival. When God's people are more concerned about their jobs and their careers than about the kingdom of Jesus Christ and salvation of the lost, we need revival. 
when God's people get together with other believers in conversation is primarily about the news and about the weather and about the sports and, and about everything that's going on in the world today, rather than talking about the things of God, we need a revival. When church has become predictable business as usual and it's no longer more than any other social club that you can go to and you can gather and you can become a part of, we need a revival. I am interested in a stirring and the moving in the presence of God. When believers can be at odds with each other and not feel compelled to consult or to pursue reconciliation, we need a revival. When we will watch things on the television and things on the internet and movies that are not holy and acceptable unto God, we need a revival in the church. When church people don't care to sit down and watch things that they know that their eyes should not be on and don't have a care about it, we need a revival in the church. Now I'm not talking about a revival in the world. I'm talking about a revival in the church. Amen. We need a revival in the church. A revival means to revive something that has already been. When our hearts are cold and our eyes are dry, we need revival. When we are content to live with uh, explainable, ordinary Christianity and ordinary Christian services, and we're just content with being religious, we need a revival. When people have to be entertained to be drawn to the church, we need revival. Now, I'm not against the lighting. I'm not against... Uh, the things that we see in the church world today, those things are wonderful. But when those things become greater than the move of God, we need a revival. I've said it before and I'll say it again, that I would rather have a moving of the Spirit of God and have service out in a tent in the heat and the cold than to come into a beautiful edifice of a building and have no power and have no demonstration and see no operation and see no feelings and see no passion about the presence of God than to have all of those things in this beautiful building. I would rather have the power of God and step out into a tent and see people filled with the Holy Ghost, seeing people baptized, and seeing the demonstration of the power of God in operation. Can you give Him praise in this house this morning? Amen. That's not what I even came to preach about this morning. We're going to go to the book of Numbers, chapter number 17, and we're going to read a few verses of Scripture here this morning, beginning in verse number 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and take every one of them a rod according to the house of their fathers, of all their princesses according to the house of their fathers, twelve rods, and write thou every man's name, Upon his rod. And thou shalt write Aaron's name upon the rod of Levi, for one rod shall be for the head of the house of their fathers. And thou shalt lay them up in the tabernacle of the congregation before the testimony where I will meet with you. In verse 5, And it shall come to pass that the man's rod whom I shall choose shall blossom. And I will make to cease from the murmurings of the children of Israel, whereby they murmur against you. Verse 6. And Moses spake unto the children of Israel, and every one of their princesses gave him a rod apiece, for each prince one according to their father's houses, even twelve rods, and the rod of Aaron was among their rods. In verse 7, And Moses laid upon the rods before the Lord in the tabernacle of witness. And then in our final verse, in verse number 8, And it came to pass that on the morrow Moses went into the tabernacle of witness, and behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi was budded and brought forth buds and bloom blossoms, blossoms and yielded almonds. Dear Heavenly Father, as we enter into your word this morning, I ask God for you to just speak to us here today. Let us receive something from heaven. And it's in your name we pray. Can we all say amen? Well, I want to assure you this morning that we are living in the greatest hour that the church has ever known. Because we are living in a day and time where people need the Lord more than they have ever needed Him before. 
our ears have waxed cold, the churches have become cold, and, and uh, when we begin to believe God for the things that He has done for us before, we begin, or, or things that God has never done for us before, we begin to receive things that we have never had before. When we begin speaking some things into existence that we have never dared to believe God for before in our lives, things will begin to happen in our lives. You see, there are people today in the church world that are realizing that God is waiting on us. It's not the other way around. We're not waiting upon God, but God is waiting upon us. Every year I used to go uh, preach in Mississippi and a wonderful pastor, a friend of ours that, that, that was there and he's deceased now, but a wonderful man of God. And, uh, but every time you would go see him, he had a beautiful building that would probably seat four or five hundred people if you uh, packed them in there, a beautiful building. And, and each time you would go there, there would be about 25 or 30 people in attendance in this beautiful big building. And, and uh, every time you would go there, he would say, we're just waiting upon God. We're just waiting upon God. You know, there are times in our lives when we need to wait upon God, but there are also times in our lives when we've got to get up and we've got to do something. We've got to go to work and we've got to complete the mission and complete the task that Jesus Christ has invented for our lives. And so as much as year after year he was just waiting upon God, a wonderful man of God, a, a, a great man, but, but his whole life he just spent waiting for God to fill the house and to fill the seats and to fill the church. And you can go there today and it's still 25 or, or 30 or 35 people in attendance. Why? Because, yes, we need to wait upon God at points in our lives, but there comes times in our lives where we've got to get up and we've got to go about the Father's business and we've got to operate like this is the only day left that we have and we've got to serve Him in our fullest capacity. Five times in Scripture we find the phrase, and Moses did according to the word of the Lord. But somewhere along the line, Moses had a revelation and realized that I have been waiting for God to speak long enough and I need to get up and I need to start doing some talking and I need to start doing some things. And we find in the book of Exodus chapter 8 and verse 13 it said, And the Lord did according to the word of Moses. Listen to that verse. And the Lord did according to to the word of Moses. God did what Moses asked the Lord to do. I believe that what is happening in our generation is that the church of God is finally realizing that we can speak some things into existence and that God will fulfill them. We are realizing, as Jesus said in Matthew chapter 9 and in verse 29, He said, Then He touched their eyes and said, According to your faith, be it done unto you. It's according to your faith. It's according to your potential. It's according to your abilities. It's according to what God has done in your life, but it's according to the way you're speaking, what you're saying, what you're doing. According to your faith, God said, or Jesus said, it will be done unto you. We are finally realizing that the Scripture says in Ephesians chapter 3 and in verse 20, Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundant above all that we might ask or think according to the power that worketh within us. You see, God wants to do exceedingly and abundantly above everything that we might ask of Him. He wants to go above and beyond. He wants to do greater things. He, he wants to do more things. He wants to do uh, bigger things. We are daring to believe for things in this hour that we have never believed God for. And by God and through His Word and through His will for our lives, do according to the Word of His people, work according to our faith, and operate through the power that liveth on the inside of us. 
You see, there is enough power working in just one of us to do exceedingly and abundantly above everything that we might ask God for and even above what we might think we have the potential to do. When we put God in the situation, God will go exceedingly and abundantly above everything that we might ask. I can just picture Paul as he is penning this epistle. He has such a revelation of God's power that he can't even produce enough adjectives to describe what God wants to do. It is exceeding, it is abundant above everything that we can even verbalize or comprehend and it liveth on the inside of us. In other words, you don't have to beg for it to happen because it's already there. You don't have to buy it because it's already been purchased. You don't have to complete a college course in order to learn how to do it. I'm often intrigued by ministers that think that they can go to seminary and be trained to be ministers. Now, I believe in education, and I believe that we should be educated, and there's nothing wrong with ministers going to college and become educated. I believe in education. But if the calling of God is not upon your life, then you can't learn to be what God has called you to be as a minister of the gospel. It's not something that you learn to do. Now God can call you to do it and you can become uh, better through education and I believe in education once again. But I'm simply saying that it's not something that is learned. It is something that is a calling upon your life. I'm not talking about, you know, sometimes we hear the name it, claim it gospel, the name it, claim it game. I'm going to name it and claim it and grab it and, and blab it. We hear that philosophy of material wealth and possessions. You watch a lot of the uh, televangelists on the TV. In fact, I hardly ever watch them anymore. There are some that are okay to watch, but it seems like, you know, if you're not walking around as a millionaire, then you're not saved or you're cursed or you're not, you're not a full Christian almost. And, uh, and, and I'm not here to talk about televangelists, but... but This morning, uh, the the salvation of our lost loved ones and the healing of our babies and the restoration of our backsliders and the unity of our families and the protection of the blood over our children. We need to grab hold of the things of the Word of God that God has promised us. And and when when the enemy comes in like a flood, don't just give in to it and lay down in the pit and just be sorrowful and and lay in self-pity and and give up, but realize that I can speak some things and I can speak the Word of God over their lives and I I can speak healing into situations and and when a generational curse might come upon my family, I'm not going to say, okay, my dad had it, my grandfather had it and I'm just going to receive it. No, I'm going to claim the blood of Jesus over it. I'm going to claim that I'm going to be set free. I'm going to claim it over healing over my children that they're not going to get that into their bodies you see I've never been more convinced than I am in my life today that God is ready to do things in our midst in the very near future that will literally blow our minds. He wants to blow our minds. I'm talking about things that we wouldn't even believe if God were to tell us ahead of time that it was going to happen. We couldn't believe it. That's what God wants to do for us today. He wants to blow our minds. He wants to set us free. In Habakkuk chapter 1 and verse 5 it said, Behold ye among the heathen in regard and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days which you will not believe, though it be told to you. He said, I could tell you ahead of time and you wouldn't believe the things that I want to do in your life and things that I'm going to do in your life that if I told you ahead of time, you'd never believe it. You couldn't comprehend it. God said, that's what I want to do for you in your life. And so I want to say to this church this morning, I don't care what has happened in your past. I don't care how long things things have been there in your past or, or how long they've taken in your past. I don't care whether you've ever seen it happen in your past or not, God is ready to do a new thing in your life of which you have never seen before. Can you give Him praise in this house? 
In the book of Isaiah, chapter 43, in verses 18 and 19, it says, Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing, and now it shall spring forth, and shall ye not know it. I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. You see, if we're going to move into new things, into new ideas, and into new dimensions, we have got to forget the limitations of the past of yesterday. If we're going to see a new thing, we've got to forget our preconceived ideas of how things are supposed to happen. If we're going to see a new thing happen, we're going to have to remove the limitations from God and our faith and realize that God wants to do something great in our lives more than we might even be able to think because God wants to blow our minds. He wants to do great things in our lives. In our text that we have read this morning, God is establishing the authority of the priesthood. He does it in what seems to be a strange way. It seems that the tribes have been fighting about who was to perform the services of the priesthood and all they wanted was the power and the authority that came with being chosen servants who ministered in the tabernacle. They wanted the power and they wanted the authority. They all claimed that they were the chosen tribe and that they had been anointed of God and that they were anointed with power and with divine authority. And so God said, I'm tired of all this fighting. I want you to have every tribe send a representative to the tabernacle with a rod. Now, number one, the strange thing here is that the tribe of Levi and especially the house of Aaron had already been appointed to the priesthood. In other words, they had the label, but they did not have the power. They had the label, but they did not have the power. I wonder how many people are walking around in our, in our Christian world today that has the label, but they do not have the power. They may be a conduit, but they are not allowing the power of God to work through the conduit that He has called. In other words, they had separated themselves from the rest of the nation by their outward appearance, by their physical restrictions, and by their refusal to touch any unclean thing, yet there was no uh, visible show of power and authority in their lives. They were God's chosen, they had the standards down, they had those things down, but yet there was no power. And so God calls for the tribe to come to the church and He says, I will show you who I love or who I have anointed to minister to the nation of Israel. And He says, quit fighting amongst yourselves and get into My presence and I will make manifest the anointing of the power of My Spirit. The second thing that is different about this story is this. God said, Bring your walking sticks into the temple. He said, these rods, I want you to bring them into the temple. They were walking sticks. They were probably family heirlooms. They could have been hundreds of years old. They were dead. They were dry walking sticks that had not borne fruit in many years. They were sticks that had once been attached to a living, growing tree. But for years now, they had been unproductive. There was no sap left in them. There was no moisture that had been retained. They were simply dead and they were dry walking sticks. And God said, I want you to bring those dead, dry walking sticks into my house and I will show you how I'm going to pour out my anointing and I'm going to pour out my authority upon their lives because I'm going to do something that you have never seen nor experienced or witnessed before. And I'm going to do it through a dead, dry stick that has no ability to do anything, no ability to bear fruit. And then the third thing, finally, God said, I'm going to do it and I'm going to make it happen instantly. 
Now this is what really had them stumped because they knew that in order for an almond tree to produce, in order for it to produce uh, the fruit that it had to have upon its tree, that just like any tree, it's got to have the right soil, it's got to have the right amount of sunlight, it's got to have the right amount of rain, and then even in all those situations that it would take five long years before the almond tree would be able to bear the fruit that was going to produce. But God said, I'm going to take what was dead, I'm going to do it without any soil, I'm going to do it with without any sunlight and without any rain and I'm going to produce it and not am I only going to produce it but I'm going to make it happen overnight. He said I'm going to take that stick that was designed to bring forth fruit but that now has just become a showpiece for somebody's craftsmanship. He said that thing is going to bear fruit again. He said, I am going to establish authority before the apostles ever come along and I'm going to do it by taking your ideas and by taking your timetable and your expectations and I'm going to blow you out of the water with what I'm just about to do. You say that it takes five long years under perfect conditions to bring forth almonds upon this tree but God said I'm going to do it overnight and here's what I'm saying to you this morning this church this morning we might as well throw down the blueprints for revival that we have designed up and we might as well throw them out the window because God is ready to do something to establish apostolic authority in His church that is unlike anything that we have ever seen or witnessed before. Now I'm not talking about a denomination I'm talking about a commission. We may have carried the name of Jesus and the label for a long time, but we have not had the power of Jesus Christ like we really need. We may have separated ourselves from the world, and we might not touch any unclean thing, but we have not seen the power and the authority that we need in the church right now. But right now, God is establishing an apostolic authority in His church that is being confirmed upon those who will seek the commandments of Jesus Christ the way that God is going to prove himself are to those that are loyal to those that are committed to those that are seeking him to those that are hungry and thirsty to those that are ready to be filled with the gift of the Holy Spirit God wants to pour down his spirit upon this church he wants to give you the spirit of God this morning he wants you to step out and become hungry and thirsty for the power of God. Let me share with you what I feel that God has shown in this passage of Scripture. Number one, the reason that Aaron was chosen to be the messenger of God is because in Exodus chapter 4 and verse 30 it said, And Aaron spake all the words which the Lord had spoken unto Moses, and he did the signs in the sight of the people. You see, Aaron didn't tamper with the message. He didn't try to decide what God really meant and what He really didn't mean was important, but He spoke all the words that God had given Him. God is conferring authority upon those churches and believers in this generation that are keeping the message of Jesus Christ. God is going to give power to those who will speak all of His words without trying to decide what we can get rid of and and what we don't keep and what we do do and what we do allow and, and what we don't allow. God's Word tells us what to do and if it's in God's Word, we need to keep it and if it's not in God's Word, then we don't need to 
preach it and express it. But if it's the Word of God, the Word of God is what is going to set forth revival in the house of God. God is going to give power to those who do not dilute the message of Jesus Christ. God is giving power in this generation to those who will hold to the doctrines and the teachings of Jesus Christ and be undefiled. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, in verse 3 and 4, it says, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to the wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud knowing nothing but doing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, ravelings, and evil surmisings. 2 Timothy 3.16 says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. 2 Timothy 4 verses 2 and 3 says, Preach the word, be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust, they shall heap to themselves teachers having itchy ears. In 2 John chapter 7 and, or in 7 through 9, it says, For many deceivers are entered into this world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the, he hath both the Father and the Son. Ladies and gentlemen, God is going to work through those who hold to the doctrines and the teachings of God's Word. I don't care what the label says on the front door. God is going to bless those who hold to the doctrines of faith toward God, repentance from dead works, baptism by water immersion in the wonderful name of Jesus, in filling of His Spirit by the evidence of speaking in an unknown tongue, a holy life that is, a, that is separated unto God. You see, I don't care if you come to church and you get baptized and, and you speak in tongues, get filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. If your life is not an example, if you go out and you talk about things that you should not talk about and, and you do things that you should not do, your life is not pleasing unto the God, unto God. You can speak in tongues all you want to, but you've got to live it when you get into the world. You can label, you can have the label, but now it's time to receive the power that comes with the anointing. And the second thing that I feel that God is going to do is to reveal His power in a way that we have never seen before is sometimes we think that we have God all figured out. We think that we know how, when, and why, and where God is going to do a miracle. But I want us to look in the Scripture just real quickly how many ways that Jesus healed. Sometimes He would just simply speak the Word. And a person would be instantly healed. In other examples, Jesus would touch them and they would receive their healing. In another case, we remember the lady that was trying to press her way through the crowd and, and she could not get to Jesus, but she was determined that she was going to get Him. And the Bible said that all she did was touch the hem of His garment and her infirmity was removed. Then we see an example where they made mud pies and put them into the man's poor eyes and he received his healing. In other examples, we see the faith of someone else touch Jesus and bring a healing to another person's body because of the faith of somebody else. 
In the early church, they laid hands upon the sick and they sent anointed handkerchiefs. And in one case, the very shadow of Peter passing over the sick body raised that sick body back to perfect health. We need to realize that God can move whenever He wants, wherever He wants, through whoever He wants, and He can move in any way that He wants to. He is not bound by time. He is not bound by space. He is not bound by the laws of physics. He is not bound by nature or any other thing. He is a supernatural God, and supernatural abilities trump the abilities of nature. He can calm the waves or He can walk upon the waves of the storms. He can make tables for a living or He can just pull money out of a fish. The only thing that limits God this morning is our expectation of what God can do. You see, sometimes it's hard for us to accept a new thing. But if we are going to receive the anointing, we need to realize that God is going to bring it to us in a way that we have never experienced it before, exceedingly, abundantly, above everything that we can think. Then the third thing as we close this morning, return to the music, is that God is going to bring a miracle through a means that we think has long been dead. I felt in my spirit for weeks and I can't get rid of it. There are people in our families, people in our community, that at one time they were members of the body of Jesus Christ, living and thriving and growing and bearing fruit, but for whatever reason, they've become separated. From the vine. And now they're dead and dry and bitter and angry. Not one ounce of desire left in them to serve God, so we think. Ladies and gentlemen, God wants to do a miracle in our midst that we have never seen before. And He's going to do it through people that are dead. Not only dead but twice dead and plucked up by the roots. Nothing much more than a corpse. You know something? There are people that are sitting in the bar rooms today that have the calling of God upon their lives to preach the Word of God. There are people that I have heard made the statement that I would rather die than step back into a church. But the call of God is upon their lives to sing for Him. There are people who are living what they think is the high life right now. And the calling of God is upon their lives to teach the children and to teach the Word of God. You see, God has a special purpose for the restored backslider. And I believe that one of the reasons that God used Peter to preach the message of Pentecost that when he faced the crowd of 3,000 people in Jerusalem, he was looking at folks that had denied Jesus, that had crucified Jesus, and that had mocked Jesus. And when they asked him, they said, Peter, what must we do to be saved? You know, a man that may not have known what they were going through and may not have felt what they were feeling, may have said, oh, you can't be saved. You're just a bunch of heathens. You've gone too far. You denied Jesus. You can't claim Him now. 
But you know something Peter remembered when he himself had denied Jesus. He remembered how he had miraculously been forgiven and restored without without hesitation. And so Peter said, in order to be saved, you've got to repent and you've got to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he said, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. You see, God uses broken vessels to minister to broken vessels. God uses broken reeds to repair other broken reeds. And God is saying He's going to use dead, dry sticks to bring forth the fruit that He wants to bring. So we stand in this building this morning. I've said it before and I'll say it again to all you parents of backslidden children, children of backslidden parents, husbands of backslidden wives and and of backslidden husbands and everyone else who has someone that is backslidden in their life this morning. Don't you believe the lie of the enemy that says they'll never come back. I want to quote from Jeremiah 31 and verses 16 and 17. It says, Thus saith the Lord, Refrain thy voice from weeping and thine eyes from tears, for thy work shall be rewarded, saith the Lord, and they shall come again from the land of the enemy. And there is hope in thine end, saith the Lord, that thy children shall come again to their own border." God is ready to produce fruit and He's ready to do it overnight. He's ready to do it instantly. We don't have to wait four months. We don't have to wait six months. We don't have to wait five years. God can take a dried up, dead, dry bone and in an instant He can turn it into fruit and He can turn it into production and He can turn it into doing something again. Dear Heavenly Father God, we just love You and worship You today. God, we're so thankful for Your Spirit that is here with us this morning. I pray, dear God, for those that are here this morning, maybe they're dried up, maybe feel dead in their body and their relationship. I pray today, God, that something would begin to stir on the inside of them. Lord, that there would be a reviving spirit that begins to revive from the inside out. I pray for those in this assembly this morning, God, that has loved ones or or children or a spouse or a sibling or someone that they love dearly in their lives that used to be in relationship with you and and now this person has gone and and they're dead and they're dry. But yet, God, there's something on the inside of them. I pray, God, that you would begin to revive that spirit. God, quicken our hearts, quicken our spirit, quicken our our thinking, God, quicken ourselves, God, unto You. This altar is open this morning as we close our service. We're going to sing in just a moment. We will have a baptism. But this altar is open to you today and we are extending an invitation and asking you to come and make Jesus the Lord of your life as we sing.